Welcome to Opera Talks. I'm Larry Hancock, General Director of Opera San Jose, and today I have with me conductor Ming Luke and stage director Michael Schell. We are all involved in creating a new production of Mozart's The Abduction from the Seraglio, which will open at the California Theater in San Jose on September 15th, marking the opening of our 35th annual season. Uh, We've shied away from abduction in the past. As a matter of fact, it never even made it onto any list for consideration because it's just too hard for a company of our size. All the roles, every role in the opera requires a specialty voice. And of course, being a resident company, uh, we needed voices that could sing a wide range of things. And we never wanted to venture into the rarefied atmosphere of Mozart's first successful opera. And uh, we got brave <laughs> because we had met some singers who we thought were equal to these very difficult roles. And so here it is, Abduction from the Seraglio for the first time in San Jose in a new production, obviously. And these two gentlemen with me have been instrumental in making certain that this production is going to be entertaining and physically beautiful and musically sublime. And I promise you, it is musically sublime. I've been in several rehearsals now, and it's it's just lovely. And I didn't expect it to be. And so I'm greatly relieved. <laughs> so, okay, guys, welcome. Ming, I know that you do work in San Francisco at the ballet, and you do lots of other stuff. And in your bio, it talks about you being in Russia and in many parts of Europe doing work. Bring me up to snuff. What was that all about? Uh, well, for me, you know, conducting, it's it's funny in the U.S., we oftentimes pigeonhole conductors. There are opera conductors, there are symphonic conductors, education conductors, pops conductors. And then there's Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, for some reason, we got away from this idea that, you know, conductors should have a wide range of experiences. I mean, you know, obviously Mozart didn't write only operas, so only specializing in Mozart operas and not knowing, you know, his concert uh, songs and arias and, um, you know, his symphonies, etc. it doesn't make sense. You know, one of my favorite years is 1870 uh, when Tchaikovsky tried to kill himself and in that year he wrote Eugene Onegin and the Fourth Symphony mm. and both of them have references to the fact that he feels like he lost his innocence and identity you know when Lenski gets murdered in um, um, by Onegin in the Birch Mm -hmm. tree forests. The birch trees have such a symbolism of, of purity, right, for, for the Russian uh, um, uh, culture. And the same thing happens in the Fourth Symphony. The Fourth Symphony has this, uh, has this folk song at the very end, the Fourth Movement, which everybody plays bomba bombastically, ba -ba 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 -da, which is basically, you know, a, fr a, a, a um, Russian folk song about the birch tree forest. Hmm. And so this idea that you'd play that bombastically completely eliminates it from any direct contextual, uh, um, you know, uh, relevance to his life at the time. And so if you segregate yourself to only, you know, operatic repertoire, or only symphonic repertoire, I think you lose a lot. Hmm. And so for me, I like the variety because I find it informs um, each other a lot. You know, I like being in the pit with dancers because they, it's the same art form, you know, um, but musicians and dancers speak completely different languages. Um, I love opera because it's almost everything put together in the same, you know, in the same production um, sets, being in the pit, working with musicians that might not be able to hear um, what's happening on stage, working with a whole bunch of different people. I like being in the symphonic world where it's only, you know, focused on, you know, this is uh, the symphonic sound and trying to recreate at that moment um, really um, fantastic textures and line. And so I think it's all about, uh, for me, um, um, a little bit of everything, because I think like Bernstein, you know, it's it's just sort of this American way anyway. He was such a great composer, had experience with jazz, you know. Um, the mass was just ridiculous, you know. Um, you know, <laughs> West Side Story, and then of course all the symphonic works um, is you know. Um, sort of a gestalt. And so I think that for me, some people like to focus on certain areas, but I think that it's much more rich um, when you can have um, many different experiences from which to draw. You know? I am in complete agreement about that. Uh, I, I truly believe that the more you know, the better you do everything you do. And people who get very pointed, very specialized, and, and close the rest of the world off lose contact with everything. In my own life, my great regret is that I'm, I've always been pretty much closed off to contemporary life. 
as a child, when I was deciding I was going to have piano lessons, my piano teacher would play me three pieces. I always chose the classical piece. That was where I was drawn to. I was never interested in popular music. Couldn't tell you who those people were. Uh, I knew about the popular musicians for being in the, the soda shop at my university. So you heard the jukebox going mm. 24 hours, right? So mm-hmm. Lay Lady Lay was part of my repertory then. <laughs> and I've looked at clouds from both sides and <laughs> all, all that kind of stuff. But I would, I've never spent five minutes pursuing any interest outside serious classical music except for the songs of the 30s, 40s, hmm. which I love to sing, because mm-hmm. I can. <laughs> I can't sing songs, art songs anymore. <laughs> they ask too much. I'm nearly 70, right? So the, the vocal control is gone, but I can still sing. They can't take that away from me, oh, right? Wow. I can still Great do that. Um, but I think everything is enriched. Mm-hmm by a broader understanding, and I'm going to say, in particular, for stage directors. Uh, I think so, too. I, I feel like, um, uh, you know, working here is actually an example for me of that, of being able to do that, because like conductors, we often get sort of pigeoned in, pigeonholed into a style. Oh, I remember when you stuff. first came, and you were saying you are almost exclusively used for comedies. Yeah. Because you came for the Italian girl. Yeah. Well, I believe if you really are good at understanding wit, you're good at understanding tragedy. Which I was so grateful that you thought that, because I've been able to do such a variety here, getting to do Italian girl, and, and then, uh, of course, Silent Night, uh, and then Bohem, and now doing something that's... A pretty much a mixture of, of, of both of sort of the comedy and a, and a drama. We've talked about this before, sort of saying that Mozart writes, in a way, the best romantic comedy, where it has that sensitivity in drama, but it also has a very well-crafted comedic sense. Genuine comedy. Yes, Genuine absolutely. Genuine comedy. Absolutely. Yeah. And so... Um, it's great to be able to do that because uh, all of the experiences that I've had as a singer, but also the things that I enjoy going to see are a combination of all of those things. And I'm, I'm, as a director, I'm so interested in what motivates people. Actually, in life, I'm inter- interested in what motivates people to act. You know, what, what, what's really behind uh, someone's choices? Um, and not in a judgmental way, really just, just an know. observant. Just to know. Yeah. And so I think that helps. In, it, it, it certainly uh, tells me how I approach or shows me how to approach my work in dealing with these characters. Why do they behave this way or why do they sing all of those notes as we experience in this... Too many of them. Right. <laughs> as we experience in this opera in particular. So The, when <clears throat> the whole idea of this came from Cory Dastur. Because mm-hmm. she, she has sung Blonda. Mm. And she thought we should be doing it. And I said, it's outside our reach. We can't do it. Right. Just forget it. We're going to do Don Giovanni. We're not going to do it. Um, I, I personally find Don Giovanni the least satisfying of all the Mozart operas mm-hmm. that I know well. For me, it's the least satisfying. It's the most schizophrenic. It's got, it's got too many. It's got multiple personalities. Mm-hmm. It's, got, mm-hmm. it's got issues. Right. Uh, for me, anyway, because I'm always looking for the through line. What what is the right. through line in this? What is the overarching? dramatic statement that's being made here Mm -hmm. and don giovanni it's hard for me to follow it it's just hard for me to follow it i understand what you said and other people find the character don giovanni to be an archetypal hero the romantic hero like a lord byron Hmm. well i do equate him with lord byron who i can't bear Hmm. you know i've often thought he should have been drowned at birth Hmm. (laughs) anybody who treats his mother that way Hmm. doesn't deserve to be on the planet Mm -hmm. um and how much is his poetry worth really Right, right. Compared to what he did to human beings, um, his wife, the boys he picked up and dropped in various mm-hmm. places and left them stranded. And, no, 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 not for me. Um, but 
so not having to do Don Giovanni <laughs> was kind of appealing. Right. Um, and there were no, no of, the, of the known Mozart operas could we have done because there was not enough time gone mm-hmm. by since mm-hmm. we'd done them. Right. So abduction was kind of the choice, unless you want to do Mitri da Terre di Ponto, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> which I don't think, yeah. could, or Lucio Silla. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> which is longer than you know a generation. <laughs> All right. So at any rate, so but I did know when I, when I sat down and and looked at it because I didn't know it all that well. I thought only Michael Shell. Oh. So I told Corey, if we can get Michael Shell, we can consider it, but only if Michael is available and can do it. Because I've seen it. I've seen what you've done yeah. with the Italian girl <laughs> and Silent Night. And then you didn't object to my interfering with La Boheme. <laughs> so I figured we could work out a partnership. Because <laughs> I decided we had to change the period of Boheme yeah. to right after World War I. And I wanted somebody to have been terribly wounded right. in that war. And I decided that it should be blindness because that would be the least interfering and I decided it should be Colline mm-hmm. who is the philosopher mm-hmm. and Michael wasn't too pleased about the idea <laughs> we talked about it we had, a, we had an engaged discussion and ultimately I think it was it was quite challenging but I think it was it was an interesting look at a show in a way that didn't take away from the spirit of the piece it actually, in in some ways, I think it enhanced it in a way that I wasn't surprised. I, I mean, I was surprised how it enhanced it. What I knew is, now, everybody else who was in that opera is going to hate me right now, but my two best actors mm-hmm. were singing Colline and Chonard. Yeah, sure. And in La Boheme, as it is normally conceived, they are wallpaper. Yeah. They're there to fill in for the quartet. Right. That's all they're for. They have no story. They have no backstory. Everybody's constantly wondering, what is it about? Where do these guys live? Mm-hmm. They don't live here. Where do they live? What do they do? And, right. and uh, what's going on with them? That's a constant thing. And I thought, I would like my best actors to have an opportunity to be part of the opera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they were magnificent. They were. They were great. I was so lucky to have them in that, in, you know, to, to take on... Uh, uh, an idea like that and knowing that you'd have people that were willing and also capable of doing it. So. That's not to say that I didn't have both of them in my office. The first <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> Colin Ramsey, the, like the second rehearsal, he came, this is not going to work. It's taking too much time. My character's <laughs> taking too much time. Uh, the time needs to be spent with Marcello and Rodolfo and I'm taking too uh, much time. Well, anyway, that's not this show. Yeah. So we should talk about the abduction from the Australia. First of all, the thing that, that is important for, I think, folks to understand is that Idomeneo was produced in January, February of the, that year, 1791. Mm-hmm. Pardon me, 1781. And so he's coming from the high of having produced what was thought to be a great work Mm -hmm. in Munich and then being commanded to go to Vienna when he would just as well hang out and be appreciated, right? Right. So he has to go to Vienna where he's now purely a servant, not a visiting artist, but purely a servant in the household. And he despised that. Uh, And, but there he was. And it's the most momentous year of Mozart's life. Sure. Uh, Everything happened that year that made everything else possible. Mm-hmm. And his first chance, he was, by summertime, uh, the Viennese crown knew that the Archduke of Russia, who was the crown prince, was going to be visiting Vienna, they thought, in September. And the emperor did like Mozart's music. He heard him performing music that he had composed at a fundraising event for widows and orphans of musicians. And he then got decided he wanted Mozart to have something. Hmm. So Stephanie uh, gets busy and says, we, we need a thing here. And they decide to produce this in one of the state theaters for the visit of the, the Grand Duke of mm-hmm. Russia. Mm-hmm. And they very politically... They found an abduction 
It was called Belmont and Costanza. It had premiered in Berlin, the arch rival of Vienna, right? So for the center of culture. And they stole the libretto. Oh, my God. <laughs> they stole the libretto. Wow. And... And because they needed something right now, because sure. this thing had to be done, we're talking summertime, and it had to be done in September. Right. Mozart was going to have like six weeks to create a new opera and get it on the boards. I love that that's the time frame to not only write the opera, orchestrate it, and but also stage it and <laughs> costume it and produce it. And it's going to go off in September. <laughs> For a visiting crown prince. I mean, <laughs> that's just, wow, okay. You know, the opposite of Luli's approach, which was a year. Right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, so anyway, boom. Uh, thankfully, um, Though a great deal of the work was completed by the end of August, right. um, the Grand Duke didn't come. Ah. He came much later. And so Mozart and Stephanie had the opportunity now to look at this libretto, consider what's going on. Why was that libretto chosen? Because Catherine the Great intended to take over Turkey. Hmm. That was her goal. Oh, interesting. Even to the point of naming one of her sons Constantine. Huh. <laughs> so he would live in Constantinople. Oh, right? wow. Oh, my gosh. And he, he would be running Turkey. That was her ultimate long-range strategy to get a warm water port. She needed to own Turkey. Uh, and, and she made efforts to come down. But anyway, that was one of the things. And, but it was also in, all in German and created by German-speaking people. And it was a German art form, a Zinkspiel, right. not a true opera. Uh, and so that would appeal to the Grand Duke and his German wife, mm. who had great German sympathies. So they were trying to go up against Berlin and say, we're just as German as they are. Uh, and they're trying to say to Catherine, and, and Turkey is a lovely place. <laughs> 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 so all this comes together. Right. But, but they hadn't thought about their own emperor. And Mozart, in deciding, well, we've got some time now. Let's relook at the source material and see what we could do. And so now they're going to create something that has enlightenment sensibilities. Hmm. And that's the role, the speaking role, no music has to be right. involved, of Pasha Selim. Mm -hmm. He is an enlightened monarch. Right. So there we have the right. relationship to the emperor. Sure. who thought of himself as an enlightened monarch. Ah, so, uh, and so they were trying to get all these things wrapped up with a bow so everybody would like it. And that's why the opera might seem a little schizophrenic mm -hmm. because it switched, just as in The Magic Flute, it switched its direction in mid-course. Mm -hmm. So we have silly, almost slapstick comedy mm -hmm. that's very visual and very fast and running, mm -hmm. lots of running around. And then we have... The deep sorrow yeah. of Constanza, mm -hmm. which raises her to a level as taking us directly to the Countess. Sure, sure. And then this Pasha Selim, who comes in like a Sarastro, yeah, yeah. who has philosophy, who has morals, who doesn't take advantage of his authority, forcing people to do things. And where does that come from? Right out of opera seria. Sure, sure. Right? Yeah. So Mozart is very comfortable with all that. Right. So and then what happens? It finally does open, and it's a, a joy for everybody. And it, unfortunately, it showed the Zinkspiel, which had been folk music, and pop tunes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and only silly Hans Wurst, Danny Kay comedy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what it had been. And then here comes this sublime yeah. Mozart, and they all went. We don't want any more of that old zinc spiel. Right. <laughs> we want the Italian opera buffa back because it's going to have serious music in it, beautifully composed. And, they'd, and, they, and, and the emperor had to give up the idea of the German zinc spiel. Oh, that's interesting. He had to give it up. Wow. And, and the Italian opera buffa was restored because <laughs> he huh. kicked them out. So it, it actually, this is the, the beginning of the death knell of the zinc spiel. And then, of course, the magic flute just laid them all in the shade. Yeah. For me, the most interesting thing, because I like where did something come from? How did we get here from there? Mm -hmm. It's the first theatrical work that stayed in the repertory. Mm. 
And that's what is, true, huh? Yeah, that's true. Wow, yeah. And what's the next one? Nazi de Figaro. Right, sure. <laughs> yeah. And what's the next one? Don Giovanni. Right. And what's the next one? The Magic Flute. Flute right. All these people composing music all over the place. Yeah. But the foundation stones of modern opera yeah. are all laid by Mozart. Sure. Hmm. He is a great genius. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. A great genius. Yeah. And so, I think you see that in this piece, the ante the sort of the precursors for a lot of what's going to come and 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 maybe uh, I shouldn't say better. I should say maybe more thoughtfully edited. Yeah, that's yeah. Because he's not having to make a comedy. Right. Because when you get to the marriage of Figaro while it was advertised as an opera buffa. It's f it's not. Yeah, it's not buffa. No. no, it's not. Yeah. I mean, it is deadly serious. Yeah. And, well, here's the thing about Mozart that constantly intrigues me. Don Giovanni being the best example. Mozart does not cast judgment. No. No. He leaves it for you. He doesn't hide anything. Everybody's there with their warts and moles. Right. It's all there. It's clear as a bell. But he gives them all divine music. He mm -hmm. gives them all beautiful music. He sets them in the most perfect settings. Yeah. And if they're a Baroque pearl, that's up to you to figure out as the audience right. member. You, I think absolutely in this, because when you look at a character like Osmin, who's supposed to be sort of the quote-unquote villain yeah. or evil guy... He's given this third act aria that has all of this amazing coloratura that's not necessarily violent in its in its writing. It's actually kind of harmonious and beautiful in a strange way because he's so excited about the fact that he's finally captured, the, especially Pedrillo, he's capturing dance. yeah <laughs> that he's dancing and it's this joyful aria. And of course, is humorous, but but just like Constanza and just like Belmonte, the two romantic leads, if you had to choose, he has the same kind of lyric coloratura music. It's fascinating. And that takes me to our conductor, <laughs> because I'm sitting listening to that giant quartet. There's, there's, a, there's at the an end of Act Two, yeah. Extended quartet at the end of Act Two. By the way, all the rewrites were written because Mozart wanted Act Two to end with a finale ensemble. Huh. And all the rewrites came from that desire. Wow. Um, so it's long. <laughs> there are a couple of long pieces in this show. I mean, yeah. uh, crazy for their time long. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're accustomed to long Baroque arias, but these are crazy long. Martin Aller Arten, that's crazy long. 60 measures of introduction. <laughs> That's crazy long. Uh, but what I was going to get to with that quartet, first of all, for a stage director, it has action. Yeah, absolutely. It's telling the story. Absolutely. It really does have action in it. So it's an ensemble yes. that's not an ensemble. Right. It's, it's an ensemble that tells the story, and it has so many different moods. It's got to be at least three, four sections. Yeah, definitely. more, yeah. Even more than that, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and they're really clearly, mm -hmm. we're, we're, now we've moved into this territory, and uh-oh, now we're moving into this territory. Yeah. As the girls get more and more angry, and the guys yes. become more and more contrite. Yes. But then we have all these sublime trebles. And I sit and listen to it, and I think, Richard Strauss mm. memorized this music. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because that's what you get. And, and that Rosen Cavalier trio, you so often get with, with two women singing in the top, these two equal voices just spinning around each other in the stratosphere. It's so, it's so Straussian. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, and, and it's just uh, like you were saying is the, the fact that there's dramatic intention and progression in it is very striking because a lot of the rest of the opera is not like that. No, it, you no, know, music was not like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Didn't do that in music. It's brilliant. Which is the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I love that moment is because you're not having to 
there's so much to mine from that because it's so clear. The dramatic action is so the clear. Intention, yeah. At the same time, it's not the same kind of work that you're doing when you're dealing with, for example, Martinella Artin. And she repeats text quite a bit in that. And so and how do you find that through line? And she vacillates. She vacillates yeah. within it. And that's what's, that's the... In many ways, maybe that's not even a good example because she does vacillate so much between one thought and the other thought. But still, the time th that it takes to... The, the length of the aria uh, makes it problematic, not only uh, a challenge for the singer, absolutely. I mean, oh first, goodness, first and, and foremost. And what they say for the end, what Mozart says for know. the yeah. end of that it's aria. It's just like, really? Did you have to do that to her? Another high C, really? And how fast does how she fast? have yeah. so, so not only is it it's so challenging for them uh, vocally, but it's challenging to pace it so that there is a point to that last triumphant sort of scale, you know, coloratura that happens. It's like, okay, so we have to really plot this out so it feels like it was supposed to happen and that it doesn't just feel like, oh, you're repeating that section again. So. Dramatically for me, she says, you'll torture me? Mm -hmm. Fine. Yep. Torture me. Yeah. I will never be unfaithful right. to the man I love. It's not going right. to happen. And then she weakens. And th well, but you don't have to torture me. Right. Because I know you're a good guy. Yeah. And I know you don't want to do that sort of thing. Right. So you don't have to do that. You could get heaven's blessing yeah. if you didn't do that. Yeah. But do it. If that's what you're going to do, do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. You know, that's, that's what's, that's what's interesting about it. it. Also, it begs the question, you know, and that's something I talked to uh, Stephen Kemp about, the designer, set designer. You know, we, I said, you know, what the heck kind of tortures can I do to this person in a 10-minute, you know, aria on stage. I mean, really, what was, you know, so it's, it's one of those questions that I mean this in the, in the most um, humble way and certainly not in any kind of sarcastic way, but what was he thinking when he wrote that 10-minute aria with that text? And so it's like, how do we show this woman being tortured but, but not? Because just, you know, having someone being, you know, violently, you know, hurt in some way is not very, that's not fun for the audience in, in a way that it, after a while it's going to, you're going to be deadened to it and you're not going to really care. So what, what kind of, what kind of things can happen that will interest you, but also further that story? So it's it's an interesting challenge. Yeah, it just it just feels like a concert aria that's been plopped in yes, the middle of a, absolutely. you know an opera, and it's just you know like the introduction. You know, yeah, she just sang this major aria as it is, but to still right. have the Sinfonia concertante just in the middle, uh, yes. where you have to you know it's like how long is it? Like you know you said it's sixty bars, yeah. two full minutes or so right. of 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 nothing happening on stage. Right. You have to manufacture something for that. It's it's I think it's. Uh, well, you yeah, realize in difficult. the past they wouldn't have manufactured. No, they wouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. They would just have had it. They'd have had that yeah. music, and everyone has sat there and listened to that music right. and thought, "What is this music?" Right. It, it's like the the openings of a concerto. Sure. Yeah. Right. It's just deadly serious orchestral music. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. And uh, but but the way I see Constanza, of course, I have a problem. My, Stage director who you know, Lillian Groag. Do you, yes. do you know Lillian? She's directed the name, for us yeah, a few yeah. times. Uh, we've become actually personal friends over the years because I've known her now for almost 25 years. Mm -hmm. And we were chatting not too long ago <laughs> about something. He says, well, my problem is whenever I'm watching it, anything... I'm seeing everything through the eyes of the person who's speaking. Mm -hmm. Who's talking now? What are they seeing? What's going on with them? Mm -hmm. And then when somebody else talks, then I'm seeing it through the eyes of that person who's speaking. Mm -hmm. and, and she says, 
You're so cute. <laughs> you naive child. <laughs> has nothing to do with stagecraft, Larry. <laughs> You're just but very I, empathetic in that way. You, you kind of. I get caught yeah, up. Yeah. And, and when, when I lose interest, yeah. it's because those people have lost interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. So either the playwright lost interest, or the composer yeah. lost interest, or the singer lost interest, yes. or the stage director lost interest. Somebody yeah. lost interest in this moment. Right. And then I fall out of it, and then I just become an observer. Right. Of of what, what it's a time to look at the set. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Um, but it's like the second act of Tosca. Hmm. I don't know of any music more concentrated in that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm what's happening to those people mm-hmm. is unrelenting. Sure. It is, and I used to think I can do without the first act of Tosca and I can do without the last act of Tosca. Just let me know when is the first intermission, I'll show up. Mm-hmm. And then I'll say thanks a lot and I'll leave because I don't like any of them. I like any of those people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably why you, that's why you don't like Giovanni probably. And, and I don't, I, I am not one of the people that says that Giovanni is like the greatest. I, I, I know why people say that. And actually, I was going to say what's different about abduction versus Giovanni is that there's a similar character study going on in abduction, but the storyline uh, is the connective tissue. And this is something you were touching on. I think Giovanni is more a character study of people. And his, and because Mozart's so wonderful at not judging characters and giving them their own life, it becomes this, you know, interesting uh, mix of all of these people that, yeah, you don't, none of them are really great people. They all have their issues. They all have things that are not necessarily what we would consider like the, the, you know, the ideal way of living. You're not going to go to that opera and go, oh, that's somebody I can look up to. None of those people do you look up to. And I think that's what his genius is, is that he allows for it, like you said, he allows for all these characters to live and breathe equally and does not judge them. And uh, it's actually very difficult to get performers to do that. It's, you know, with this opera, when we were starting, uh, you know, I usually ask, you know, what do you know? What objective things do you know from the text and from maybe from the music? Can you discern, what can you discern about this character in the most objective way? And usually instantly they go to subjective because it's something they latch on to. And I get them back and we talk about, okay, well, this is my job. This is this and that and that. But then when it comes to subjective, they'll say things like, well, he's an evil person or he's, you know, oh, she's really shy or she's, you know, sad and all of this. And then it's like, okay, you, you want to get, go underneath that. If you, if you think that person is evil, like Osmin, is, if he's evil, why is he evil? Or what does he do that you think is evil? Then you start getting underneath and you start seeing that, oh, wait a minute. It's not that he's trying to be evil. No bad person, no person who is, and this is difficult. I mean, I really (laughs) truly believe this. No one who is what we would say is bad actually sets out to be bad. It is just that in their mind, in their life, they feel like that's the best course of action. And I think we have that represented in our government today. <laughs> we, see someone, we see someone who believes, I truly believe this, he believes that he is doing what is right. It just so happens that a lot of that people he has don't a agree. Sense of right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's but, the thing. Yeah. But that's the thing. That's what makes these characters interesting is when you really go from it the way Mozart did. You really attack it and go, why am I doing what I'm doing? Okay, that's why. And I'm not going to judge it. And actually, then you get to see a really clear, authentic picture of these individuals. Well, if Osmin is supposed to be evil, what is he doing? He's a gardener, right? but he's very much involved in guarding 
the harem. Absolutely. The women of the right. harem. That's his job. Absolutely. And the first thing out of his mouth is, I know what you are. Yes. You're here to get women out of the harem. Exactly. And the guy is. Exactly. He is. <laughs> exactly. He's totally right. Well, he's completely right. Well, we just, as the audience, want Belmonte to get Constanza yeah. out. So who are we to say that Belmonte is right and Osmin is wrong? And that's what's really great about it. I mean, eventually, I think we fall in love with all of them. Even Osmin in his his issues or, or what is presented as a certain kind of character, we see that he's really just he's trying to deal with all of the change as well. He's trying to deal with, you know, this woman, Blonda, who is so independent. She's a very sort of progressive minded thinking individual. And he never does. No. He and doesn't. He, and he, he, he could be no. he could chain her up. He could do what he wanted to do. He never does. No. He always walks away. Yeah, he does. He's, he's, uh, there's something about her and also about him that keeps him from really going to a place like that. People who threaten constantly oh, they're... are almost always people who feel the least powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, people who don't threaten know that they don't need to. Absolutely. Government and, case in point. <laughs> and, and Pasha Selim. Pasha, absolutely. You know, and I know what we're doing, I think, in, in terms of the enlightenment and all of what you were saying, I totally agree. In our production, I give him, because it's to the dialogue, I give him a private vulnerability that may not have existed exactly the same way. But what I think is useful for us is that as a, as a culture now, I think we think of enlightenment as someone who is mindful, who maybe acts out a certain way, but then they're thoughtful. They think about the way they just behaved and they think about what do they really want. And this guy is struggling with that. He has a persona of being strong and wanting to demand love from this woman, but the private side of him is struggling with that because something about that doesn't feel right. And that's kind of why we moved, that's most of the reason why I moved the period a little bit, was putting it right near the end of the Ottoman Empire. It seemed to be a place and a time where there's a lot of change going on. And I thought, with the harems ending, you know, shortly after that, um, it was like, it was the right place to make this more about a culture clash rather than and a and a times changing rather than evil Turkish people versus good, very yeah, good exactly. white people. And Mozart doesn't do that. No, and he doesn't. No. But typical productions will Would have do. you think that these guys, these Turkish yeah. people, are the evil people, yeah. and oh, these are the 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 nice good white people that need to be freed. Yeah. Yes, they they are being kept, but it's really a misunder it's a miscommunication and a lack of understanding of the culture. So, I've had to walk out of a magic flute. I'm sure because the uh, Monastatos and all his buddies came out in black paint with yeah. bananas around. Like, yeah. Uh, oh uh, God! Really? Came, oh wow! Uh, the oh uh, the famous. Uh, American who went to Paris and made it big. Uh, Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker. She had an act where she wore bananas as yes. a costume. Yes. Yes. So those their outfits were based on Josephine oh, gosh. Baker's but bananas. <laughs> oh my lord! And that's a lack of awareness. And yeah. they went out dancing around like the wow. savages that you would see in, in, a, in a silent film. And I. I just had to, excuse me, pardon me. Excuse <laughs> yeah. Me, sorry, excuse me. But was, I, I couldn't subject myself to it anymore. Right. It was, it was just wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, we move in this Wednesday. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, actually, I was thinking about that. It was like, I put us on the schedule because I really, uh, uh, maybe 
a little bit of a tighter schedule because I wanted to get a chance to run it because I knew we had this extended time because of Labor Day and getting into the theater and all of that. Um, and I think it was beneficial because we did our run through that first run through last night. We're going to do another one tonight. And just the sheer fact that they ran through it and it felt like it was a show last night. It really did. Hey, the covers yesterday afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were really very strong and musically very firm. I, I was, I'm very yeah. happy. I'm, this, knock some words. Right? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, that was the other thing. Uh, Rory, the, the AD, he was on the way back to the, the apartment. He said, you know, I know this is totally crazy, but if we had... If we had to, if we had to put them in costumes and put them on a stage and put the orchestra there, they could have actually given a really great performance tonight. I said, I know. <laughs> I said, I hope we don't peak too soon. <laughs> but we have a few days off, so that'll ju we'll just have to gear up again. So, so yeah. letting things mellow is good. It's good. It, it, yeah. it's good. And this great. group in particular, they're really, they think about it. Um, particularly uh, Rebecca Davis and uh, Brittany, uh, the two Constanzas. Yeah, they're they, they take it home and they think about it and they bring they something, it, yeah. they internalize it and then bring it back and it's, you can absolutely tell. Um, I'm so pleased that Brittany's going to actually have a scheduled performance. Yeah, because beautiful she, voice. That's an impressive woman. Yeah, very yeah, impressive. Gorgeous what, voice. Very. voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, we've, auditioned her in New York on two occasions and I was so pleased that finally there was an opportunity that she would be able to right. you know auditions are so frustrating because you hear something spectacular right. and you have nothing for them right yeah right or, or or you have something for them but they're not available they have yes. to do something else it's, it's uh, the whole process of casting is a, a <laughs> study in disappointments um, <laughs> but to have Brittany finally with us mm -hmm. I'm so happy to have yeah. her here because she's always walked in with this wonderful sense of gravitas mm -hmm. just walking into a room she just brings it with mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. There's a great sense of confidence, competence, yeah. and self-regard yeah. that makes you comfortable in her presence. Yes. The whole everybody is. Oh just, yeah. I mean Matthew. I, I their last names are escaping me right now. But Matthew R. Belmonte, Michael uh, Daly. Daly. I, I've known him for a while, but that's why I know his last name. But yeah, Matthew um, Grills. And, and he's uh, new to us. So many of these people are new to us. Matthew Ashraf Swalim, Swalam. Yes. Swalam. The voice of Mickey Mouse yes. in Arabia. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> amazing. And then, um, of course, we were talking about Brittany Renee Robinson. And, and then uh, Katrina Galka. Yeah. Uh, Blonda, another person. Uh, and they all do this, but uh, just pointing out Katrina because um, she's, she's quite... An actor, she really is. I mean, she it's just everything, though. I mean, you know, music, every, right? Yeah, musicality. Yeah. You know, intention. You know, what's a really interesting part for me is that when you have an idea of development of character, right? It's not like you're setting the way they're responding directly. You mm. know, it's not this isolated thing that you're trying to lock down. Once their characters, you know, every single night's going to be slightly different, but to Absolutely. see them, it becomes much more natural, you know, yes. because it's c driven by the identity of the of the character that, that they're grappling with, that they're developing. Absolutely. You know, and so it's just why, you know, even though we've been in rehearsals for like two weeks or so, having that first run where everything just feels like they're really interacting, mm -hmm. you know, and the dramatic intention progression of the, of the operas is really coming, you know, it's wonderful, you know. That means so much when you say that because that's really, I think, that's my goal is to create a world that we all know where we're playing, what the scene is we're playing. And there is blocking there is staged sort of like this is where I think you should go and all of that. But I really want them to play it. And that's what was happening last night. They were yeah. really playing off of each other within the confines of this world that we've made. Yeah. And yeah. that's when it's lovely to watch because then it's exciting. And then, yes, there are like little changes that happen. Nothing that takes it out of, you the know, context, totally yeah. beyond the world because they all get the world that we're in. Yeah. They all understand it. Yeah. And so 
and and then when you've had a cast like this who really has the ability to do that that's the trick and i've been so worried that's (laughs) i'm worried about every single person at first i wasn't worried about who was going to sing the blonda right but now that i know that the blonda role it's i mean my goodness yes e E. yeah the highest note is e yes it just floats and she just kind of goes up there i know she'll hear this and she'll be like oh yeah I really just up there. (laughs) yeah but that's true it is it's just so impressive how um seemingly effortless it sounds knowing that full well that it's quite technical for her but she makes it look as if it's nothing yeah and that's really something so every single character yeah the belmonte the pedrillo pedrillo is crazy because he has to sing very low yes Uh and he has to sing very high which is a chant the voice is often in the crack Uh yeah Mozart does that because the pitches were different when Mozart was <laughs> right, writing. Right. So most everybody now yeah. has to spend a long time in the most fatiguing place in the yes. instrument. Yes. Which he would never have asked. Right. Because our, our our vocal cords haven't changed that much in a couple of years. <laughs> right. So. right. Exactly. So, yeah. but we never do Mozart in his real keys. Why don't we do Mozart in the real tuning? No. Why don't? Why is that? Uh, it's because the instruments developed and they start uh, changing a bit. You know, um, and and on top of that, some of the modern instruments they like to go sharper and sharper because it makes the sound brilliant. Ah. And so that's why even in inside the orchestra, there's always this constant battle because the woodwinds, who often Times have their instruments locked in certain keys, especially oboes. You know they, that's why they tune because they can't actually change too much. Uh-huh. And so <laughs> usually there's a point in a rehearsal period where the where the oboes will stand up and say, "Listen, you guys have to bring your pitch back down because I, I'm, I'm making my pitch go way too high for you guys, and I, I have to you know drop it a bit." Um, but it's it's funny to see the instruments just develop, you know. I mean, even Brahms. You think of Brahms as where all the instruments were modern at the time, and there wasn't, you know. Right, I mean, like right. the horn trio was for the natural horn. If you play Brahms symphonies on the the way the instruments were, the stringed instruments were back then, it's a completely different sound, wow. you know. And so it's 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 uh, you know part of the whole development. I mean, like you know, for instance, George and I were talking last night. George Manhattan, the uh, the music director for the production, and he, you know he's he's he asked he's like, so what instrument is the f- the piccolo player going to bring because it says piccolo in g and mm. you know what is that it's supposed to obviously you know mimic the 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 piccolo that's used in the genissary you know um uh military right you know march, yeah. and but but you know what usually you can play it on a piccolo but it's really cool if you have some other instrument that's a little bit more um rough you know like you know like nowadays you know the triangle you know, the bass drum and the cymbals are so pristine and and so clear but that's not what they were at all you know they're right. marching band and those turkish crescents that had all the jing- uh, jangles and the jingles and all the the sounds they were just supposed to mimic that and so we're curious about that the basset horns you know well it's typical for mozart because you know the clarinet um has a brighter sound than the basset horns and basset horns are a little darker and so um yeah it's i mean i think the whole orchestra uh, um was still in development Mm. you know and so it's really interesting to see what's going to happen there's a famous orchestra in vienna called the orchestra of the revolution oh yeah. yeah yeah and you can find them on youtube and there's a spectacular performance of the Eroica, the mm. Beethoven Third Symphony. Yeah. There's a spectacular performance of that thing. And you just go, oh, that's what that sounded like. Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Well, even like, I mean, like <laughs> Beethoven, I mean, like all the piano sonatas or whatnot, you know, they're for different instruments, for you know. And so um, when you hear some of these things, when you get a little further on, um, Schubert, I think, has a sonata that's almost unplayable because on the modern instrument, it's the keys are so much heavier that when they had lighter touch, they could do all this thing and they could be huh. really virtuosic in terms of certain waves of speed. And, you know, Beethoven, um, you know, has, has an octave in one of his sonatas that's a glissando. And, you know, pianists rip their hands up because the modern instrument is so heavy, Just, mm. you know, and so the Wallstein sonata, the third movement, I think. And so it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how uh, um, we're going to approximate some of these sounds because, you know, again, you know, the Janissary, you know, marching band percussion, which is what they're emulating, wasn't a clean sound whatsoever, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. It was supposed to be very, very uh, um, showy mm-hmm. and uh, sort of messy. And so. definitely out of tune. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, I, a thousand years ago, when I was a kid, I played the piano. I entered college as a piano major. And when I moved to Palo to California in my 20s, I was still playing. And my landlord had a collection of pianos. 
you went to his home and there were all these grand pianos. Uh, you hmm. ha- walked past them in order to get to the living room. There was a, a large room, a, a room the size of this, this room, with pianos in it, and you walked through them to get into the rest of the house. And there sat a playel. And I used to play some Chopin. And I kept looking at those instruments hungrily when I, were, I would come to pay the rent. And he said, you're always admiring my pianos. I said, oh, I would really love to play that play <laughs> <laughs> And I sat down and I played this Chopin Polonaise that is so hard to balance, so hard to balance. And on that instrument, you didn't have to think about balance oh. <laughs> because the bass was not resounding like a Steinway. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. I think people forget that pianos aren't that old. I mean, 1700. Right. Invented right. in 1700. You know, that's only, you know, 300 plus years or something right. like that. Well, a lot of our instruments are brand new. The clarinet was new when Mozart was writing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, if, and then in the 19th century is when we get all this stuff. I mean, the and all the keys and everything. Tubas yeah. are still evolving. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. and all the percussion instruments that are going through. But, you know, especially nowadays when you add electronics into it, you know, like Mason Bates is a fantastic composer. It goes all over the range of purely orchestral to to uh, um, to electronic, but you know, having computers even respond to the orchestra and feed back into the orchestra, it's really yeah, it's it's really interesting. You know, people think of the symphonic orchestra as sort of st- set, but you know, it's been constantly um, evolving. Yeah, well, you know, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the pianos change from month to month. Yeah, to God, the the, the way the, uh, the yeah. I, I, I missed the one that had two lids, the one that had the lid on the bottom too to project sound out on the bottom. Really? And I'm surprised that that hasn't, be, that hasn't been a thing, but, you know, I think they're a little too heavy, you know, speaking uh, of weight. But uh, Fascinating. I never knew that. There's a, you know, it's funny because speaking of Janissary uh, marches and stuff, there used to be a stop on a piano where you could put it on and it would add percussion when you're playing. You're kidding. Yeah, it's called the Janissary Stop. And it's this really bizarre, you know, because, you know, the, you know, the Ottoman Empire and, you know, these Turkish marching bands were, were, I guess, the first military bands, you know. And so they became, you know, all the rage in, in, in Vienna, especially because you were mentioning, uh, you know, um, the Vienna and the Ottoman Empire weren't really fighting at that point. It was really Russia that was sort of yeah, instigating a lot of it's things. It's going to come. It's going to kill this very emperor. Yeah. At the time of Kozi, he's going to be down there fighting off the Turks who were Ottoman Turks who were, who were very near Vienna. Yeah, yeah. And he he gets sick in that mm. battlefield and uh, and dies after what the fourth performance of Cozy, which shuts the production down. Huh. I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he commissions it nearly, and and it died after four, perform- <laughs> <laughs> died after four performances. And, and all the theaters had to close because you had to be in mourning, right? So that's why poor little Cozy didn't get off to much of a start. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That's sad. That's like Prokofiev with Stalin. You know, he died like three hours before Stalin. And so because Stalin died, they didn't find Prokofiev's body for like weeks. Oh, my god! Because everybody, the entire country basically was in mourning right. and shut down and all that kind of stuff. But Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah, Prokofiev, you know, Shostakovich seemed to, to manage that line between censorship and artistic <laughs> expression. But Prokofiev sort of... I think he was much more troubled by it, and he never settled into it. Shostakovich mm-hmm. somehow was able to thumb his nose at the and, and sort of exist in his own, you know, um, secure bubble, but you know, be affected by things. But Prokofiev seemed to be directly affected. Hmm. Um, I think Shostakovich lived a very dangerous life. Yeah, yeah, he, much, he took when, much more risks. When, but when he wrote that Lady Macbeth of Metzinsk, and Stalin came to see it. And he was put down to be killed. Uh, that's a scary thing. I'll never forget being at Carnegie Hall when Michael Tilson Thomas conducted the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra in the Shostakovich Eleventh Symphony. Mm-hmm. And when that fi- and where was I? First ring of boxes, right? But against the proscenium wall. So I was farther upstage than the first bass player. <laughs> hmm. I could look at Michael Tilson Thomas's face. Wow. And so and all that sound is just yeah. washing over. And when we were leaving, some people who I didn't know me in the box and said, "We thought we were going to have to call 911 for you." <laughs> oh my gosh. I was close to dead. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, this is incredible. Right. I didn't know that symphony. It was my my first time. Yeah. Hearing. 
it's not performed. It's not performed as much, but, you know, in general, for some reason, Shostakovich symphonies aren't as performed as much. You know, um, you know, there's this fascinating marketing study for symphonies and Beethoven. It had to be specific ones like Beethoven ninth, Beethoven fifth. And people would come out Eroica, you know, third. Just having the name Mozart would sell. It could be anything like mm. the post horn serenade, which is, you know, like background <laughs> music and just party music and stuff and, and shtick, you know. Um, but um, Shostakovich, I think it has, it has to be really, you know, Shasi 9, uh, because it's so famous, I think does well. And then everything else gets really heavy. They play, you know, the eight, a lot. seven, five, the because yeah, the seventh five's is weird. I heard the seventh, I, I heard the seventh at uh, the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. Huh, yeah. And I just happened to be in town when mm-hmm. they were giving and with the four last songs. Yeah. So, oh wow. Which which was what got my attention. So that's a that's a heavy. Wow, that's a great concert. It's so loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that symphony <laughs> is loud. Yeah. He's just it, it blows your hair back. Yeah. It's just unrelentingly wow. loud and then louder. <laughs> it's just amazing. I've never heard it before or since, but that was... <laughs> sometimes I think I'd like to live in Paris. Mm. Yeah. Because every time I go there, I walk away going, that's the most wonderful city I've ever been in. I love Paris, yeah. I would like wow. to live 30 minutes by train. Paris. <laughs> 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 Say it, Orléans. <laughs> Someplace over there, nice. <laughs> toward the Loire. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the country, okay. So Lovely, that I'm would be great. I'm mostly comfortable. That's oh where gosh. I'm going to retire to. I'm going to retire to the middle of the damn country. Not not much around. Good. So, it's uh, it's a slower life. <laughs> 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 well, we've talked and talked. Does anybody yeah. have anything else they should say? I don't think so. I don't think. I, I mean, it just, it seems like there's so much, there's an, so much opportunity in the opera, you know, because, mm-hmm. you know, Mozart seems to be putting everything into it, you know, like we were talking about. Just yeah, like he's like just doing whatever he wants, and it's kind of this unfettered yeah. thing happening. It's well, really it kind of great. it was his first chance. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted to work for the emperor in the biggest way. Right. He wanted out from under the thumb of the Archbishop of Salzburg, and he, and I believe even though maybe he didn't admit it, he was desperate to get away from his father, mm. who was an arch-villain mm. in, in my books, just an arch-villain. And the, the kid was, really, he was turning to every kind of subterfuge, any th- sneaky thing he could do to get enough money out of the archbishop mm. when he didn't have to work for the arch, without working so that he could establish some kind of a toehold in Vienna. Right. And unfortunately, he landed in the Weber household. Maybe mm. it's very fortunate because without Constanza Weber, we wouldn't have Mozart yeah. today. Mm. I mean, she literally made certain that it happened. And she married a man after Mozart was dead who funded that, <clears throat> who funded her worship of her husband, yeah. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> which is a beetle, so we have them. But he was desperate. That was Man, it's a year of living dangerously. He just got himself in trouble yeah. uh, all along. But he was having to make a point. He had only performed for the emperor the one time. Right, right. And he needed to show the emperor, I am a man of consequence. Right. I may be 25 years old. I may be from nowhere. And you may remember me as a... F- six-year-old at the piano at your mother's palace <laughs> right. but i am a man of consequence you have to take me seriously and and you have to offer me work right make them notice you by doing such fabulous work mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Yeah. don't don't let them ignore you right. just be better than everybody else <laughs> right. so he just really piled it mm-hmm. on so what, what were you, I'm sorry. I oh, know. just being in the theater with the orchestra, you know, during the normal rehearsal process for an opera, obviously, you know, during staging, singers might mark. Yeah. And so going into a circumstance where all the elements are going to be there, because like, you know, Martin Allen for instance, with that Symphonia Concertante, oh, to have the orchestra there, to have the solo instruments that are going to be there, mm-hmm. and have this, you know, all the uh, incredible vocalists, uh, uh, um, you know, performing. I think, yeah, I think I'm looking forward to uh, Absolutely. the next few weeks. Yeah. yeah. That's well, when the orchestra arrives, yeah. that, that everything is transformed. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It changes everything. 
lighting and orchestra. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Those, yeah. They transform yeah. everything. Yep. Things that you thought were just so mud ugly. Right. All <laughs> that looks good. You see it on the right. stage. Oh, no, it looks like the set model. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out of your lives. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. All the way yeah, down you. here. I know yeah. it's a long trek for oh, you. Yeah. Oh, no, actually, I, I live in Mountain View now. So this is you like. You moved south. Yeah, I moved south. So this is this is 20 minutes, 15 oh, minutes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, oh, I'm so happy about that. Yeah, <laughs> it's very close. I'll be sure to point that out to everybody. <laughs> you're nearby. Well, thank you so much for thank coming you. in. And thank you so much for giving such diligent effort to make this a wonderful opera because oh. you both of you have done your woodshedding and it's it's I think it's just on its way to being such a happy opening to our 35th season that's great, great. thank you Larry thank you thank okay bye bye